Turn with me, please, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. We're continuing our series of messages that I have entitled, Preparing for the Battle. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's saying uh, to them, uh, I just uh, saw a soldier, <laughs> and the Holy Spirit led me to write about how a Christian ought to be armed spiritually like a soldier is armed physically. And uh, then he got down to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. It feels like the heat has just come on. Does that feel about <laughs> uh, you folks? Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 16 says, And above all, boy, I mean, he meant above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, we know that the word wicked in the original language is a noun, and it's not a direct object there. It's, it means we can stand against the wicked one, the wicked one who is not other than Satan. And we talk about the fact that we should stand by faith, we should, we should walk by faith, we should live by faith, we should resist the devil by faith, and we should overcome the world by faith. And so... We got into the body of the message and we got down to the uh, designation of uh, the shield of faith and notice how it was designed and then last Wednesday night the preacher got off on a rabbit trail and as a result of the rabbit trail we did not get to finish the message that I intended to bring. Well, that was the way the Lord directed that I suppose and I'll give him credit for leading me there. And so the shield represented by faith, is represented by faith. And faith is believing something that none of your senses can pick up on. It just doesn't make sense to live by faith. It doesn't. And that's why when I was witnessing to a man one at a time, and I said, you, you do that by faith, and you trust the Lord by faith. He said, to get me to do that is like spreading wings and flying. And he said, I can't do that. And so we just live, we trust it by faith. And, for, and faith is spelled F-A-I-T-H. That means forsaking all, I trust him. Amen. And then uh, now notice secondly, how the buckler or the shield uh, it, of faith is described. And notice how it's described. This shield, we need it, it is not one of iron or leather, nor is it's like the shield they used back in the days of the Roman Empire. It's described as the shield of faith. It's not a shield made of iron, it's a shield made up of faith. And here it speaks of the daily faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to blessing, that leads to daily provision, and the strength for the journey that God has given to us here on this earth. It's a kind of faith that grounds us. It's a kind of faith that strengthens us. It's a kind of faith that calms us. It's a kind of faith that grows us. It's a kind of faith that establishes us. It is an absolutely, uh, it's an absolutely necessary, non-negotiable component of the Christian life. If you don't live by faith, Every Christian ought to know what it is to live by faith. We can't be saved apart from faith. No way. And we cannot be saved apart from faith in God. We didn't see Jesus on the cross. We didn't see him in the tomb. We did not see him after he was resurrected. We did not see him ascend into heaven. But praise God, as I heard a sermon today on the uh, internet that said, praise God, I'm going to get to see him in the air. I may not say to him then, but by faith is going to become sight when I see him at the rapture and the catching away of the saints. And so the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any 
man should boast. And so now we get saved by faith, and our entire Christian life is based on, built on, and sustained on by a consistent believing that God is, and that he is the blesser of those who place their faith in him. And that's why the apostle wrote in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And that's exactly why we are to live by faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. My, that's a great definition of, of faith. And so we all, every one of us, some live by some form of faith every day we live. We, uh, we cross bridges and we believe they'll support us. We go through tunnels believing that they won't fall in on top of us. We trust electricity, and that's why we turn on the lights here. And we uh, trust automobiles. We trust trains and airplanes and ships and buses, and believing that they are safe. And our faith in those things is well-founded, for they have proven themselves over and over again to be what way they say they are. So faith in Jesus is are far and above the everyday faith that you and I practice when we get in the car and drive it down the road or, or we cross over a bridge or drive through a tunnel. Our faith is only good as a, the object of that faith. And so when our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, our faith is someone who cannot and will not fail. Amen? And so therefore the faith of the Christian has power because of the object of faith is all powerful, amen? And true Christian faith never fails because the object of our faith never fails, amen? And we need to be sure that our faith is in the Lord. I, I, the gospel will save the souls of all of those who will repent and trust the Lord Jesus as personal Savior, and they trust the message of the gospel of Christ, and they, the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is never misplaced. But our faith in him is essential if we want to succeed in our walk with him and our trust in him, and if we want to see our enemy defeated in our efforts uh, to uh, ward off that attack to, and attempt to destroy us. Now notice the word, like I said, the shield of faith. It's necessary because it provides us with a connection with the Lord. That's, you know, that's the only way we can, we can make a connection with the Lord is by faith. Now, if you want to connect with some, your friend, you can either call them on the phone or text them and or, one of the, or have FaceTime with them or, or message them on Facebook or whatever or go see them. Uh, you can communicate with them, but you can't communicate with the Lord God in heaven outside of faith. You have to believe it if, if you're doing that. And sometimes when uh, I remember the first time I saw a couple uh, praying uh, out uh, in a, I, I, in fact, I took a girl, a lady, had my job was at the, at the Laterno plant was to take a girl down to, uh, down to the bus station every day at one o'clock. And I drove up there in front of the bus station and inside I could see through a glass there was um, a pastor of a local church and some missionaries that later I met and uh, was real good friends with. And I, uh, they were all inside and the pastor, uh, they were in the circle and he was praying. Now the first time in my whole life I'd ever seen somebody pray outside the church or inside of a house. And so I thought, boy, you could just pray anywhere. But they were praying by faith and what they were doing, they were asking God to bless this couple as they went, got on the bus, headed toward South Texas, and then across the border into Mexico to establish churches. And that's the only way we can contact the Lord and stay in contact with Him. But it's also necessary because it protects us from the enemy who desires to slay us. And so we have protection to stay us, and we have, we, we have, we have uh, his provision, rather, and his connection to, to stay us, and then we have him to faith to protect us from the enemy that desires to slay us. 
Now, if you're taking notes there, notice thirdly, consider how the buckler or the shield of faith is deployed. Now, how do you use it? If you've got faith, how do you use it? Here in this verse of Scripture, he describes it again, as I mentioned, as the shield of faith will enable us to do what? Quince all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so in the ancient world, the tips of arrows would be wrapped in pieces of cloth that had been soaked in, in asphalt, something like it. And they would uh, be set on fire and they would shoot them at the enemy. Now when the arrows hit the target, the flaming uh, uh, pitch would splatter in every direction, igniting everything that was flammable that it touched. Arrows could cause damage by piercing bodies, and the pitch would cause serious burns on the skin, and it could, be, it could burn down buildings and tents and equipment and gear as well, and, and so it was dangerous. And so the Greek word shield here is a word which means a heavy oblong Roman shield. It would provide an adequate defense against its fiery tip if, and, and deflect it because it was in a shape where it would deflect it. If the shield was leather, it would soak in water prior to, it would be soaked in water prior to the conflict and the, and the wet leather would quench the fiery arrows and protect the soldier that, who was behind that shield. And that's the way they operated during that, during that time. Every day, you and I, as saints of the Lord Jesus, are shot at by the fiery darts of Satan. The arrows they launch against us are the, are, come in the form of temptation. And those arrows are shot at us in the form of temptations to immorality, hatred, envy, uh, anger, uh, covetousness, uh, fear, despair, doubt, pride, and every other conceivable sin. And Satan and his demons come against us, continually attacking and tempting us to sin. And the fiery darts of temptation have the potential to inflict great damage on our lives, but the shield of faith has the power to quench every one of those darts. Now, how does it happen? Now notice in, in the application here of this portion of Scripture, how, how, does, how do some of these fiery darts uh, operate? How do they operate? Well, there, I put down four things in which uh, these darts come, and they're not something that everybody can see the arrow coming. There are four little secret ways in which they come. First of all, they may come suddenly like arrows, uh, uh, that sped our speed from a bow, just, just like that. A temptation may come upon us, and we have to be aware of it. And that's why every morning we should dress up for the battle. Dress up for the battle. You say, well, how, how does, would a person dress up? Well, for the last years, I've, it's always been my way to when I get up in the morning, first thing I do before I get uh, completely out of bed or sit beside the bed, I always pray Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I say to the Lord, I pray back to the Lord what he challenged me to do. And he, would, uh, he said, Therefore, brethren, I, you, you, we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. So I say, Father, here is my body a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto you, which is my reasonable service. In the second verse I say, and help me not to be conformed to this world, but help me to have my mind transformed by the renewing of my mind through the power of the Holy Spirit, that I may be able to do what? To complete the will of God in my life and the purpose that he has for me for that day. Now, uh, some uh, uh, scholars say that that has to be a one-time thing in a person's life. And, uh, and I, th I think I can remember back in Bible college days when I was at a, at a, uh, at a, at a meeting of college students, all the college students met at a, at, a, at a church, and we were over in Craig Gregson, Texas, and 
uh, we were sitting there, and one of the students at the school got up and gave a devotion and said that. He said, we ought, there ought to come a time in your life when you, uh, 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 when you uh, officially present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he said also, you are not to be conformed to this world, but you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that, uh, that boy, I remember his first name was Ted, but what he said was such a challenge to me that I just bowed my head and I said, Lord, right now I'm doing that. I want to do just exactly what the, he told me to do. And I want to put my body to you. But I feel like that's something that we ought to do every day in every situation to continually present our bodies as living sacrifice. That sounds like a paradox, but it's a living death. Die to what I want and living to what God wants for my life. And so we have to be ready because you'll never know what time one of those arrows are coming at you for temptation to do a whole lot of things. Yesterday, uh, our patience was put on trial. Has your patience been on trial, uh, tried lately? How many of you have had it tried a little, late, little bit lately? I mean, your patience had been tried. I was at a lawyer's office when actually it only took about 30 minutes to do what we did. It took four and a half hours, some close to five hours to complete what we did. And I became really impatient and I said, Lord, I gave my mind to you this morning and I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it. I'm not going to give them a, a piece of my mind to them right now. I'm, going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it. And so Brother Jerry Adkins and I were able to overcome and, and he sat there and he, we got outside. He said, Preacher, it was real hard, wasn't it? And I said, Yes, it was, Brother Jerry. We hung on but, and thanked the Lord for that. Maybe you have had your patience tried in, in situations like like you have, and, and it may be checkout counter at a grocery store or something like that. Somewhere along the line, you're going to have an arrow come right straight at you just like that. And you're going to have to be ready. If you don't, you're going to lose your cool, and you'll say some things that you're, you're really, really sorry that you said. How many have done that? Would you raise your hand? The rest of you lie. I mean, all, it, it, we, we've done it. We've had this arrow shot us just immediately, just like that, suddenly. And then they may come from unexpected sources. Like arrows shot suddenly from an enemy in ambush. And brother, have I ever had that in ministry. You can't pastor a church without expecting something to happen in, in your life to pull a rug out from under you and trust everybody. I, I guess I'm just one of those that's real gullible. And, and the people that I asked... To, come to church last Sunday, not a one of them showed up, but every one of them told me they're going to come. Every one of them. They said they're going to come. And I expected to be here. I really look forward to seeing them. In fact, I told Brother Malcolm, I said, Brother Malcolm, we're probably going to have three or four families here visit that I invited, and, and you, if you would be ready to sing that song, uh, I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. And Brother Malcolm said, we will. And I, <laughs> then I told him, they're not here. No, we used to sing it. And no, they didn't come. And that, that kind of gets next to you. You just get really next to you like you say, well, what's the use of inviting anybody? Right? But we don't give up. We keep inviting. Somebody's going to come if you've invited enough people. Amen? Just keep at it. Keep at it. And those unexpected sources. Some people might disappoint you. People that you really, really had all kinds of trust in, all at once they pull the rug right out from under you. You cannot believe what that, how that can happen sometimes. And uh, I've, uh, I've laid awake at night and scratched my, the back of my head till my hair would almost fall out and, and scratched the bottom of my elbow till it would almost bleed, all because some, somebody, some unexpected error came my way and I did not have that shield of faith out there. Also, they pierce and penetrate and torment the soul like arrows would uh, th that are on fire. Some of these things will just really, really get next to you. And, and, then they're, and then they set the soul on fire and light up 
the worst passions as fiery darts do to a build, building or a ship or a tent against which they are sent. And we burn so easily as the arrows fly toward us. Rationalism becomes something that comes naturally to, uh, to us. If God didn't want me to have this, then why did he make me with such a desire for this thing? And we'll start making excuses and say, uh, I, uh, why, why did God allow this if he didn't want me to have this? Why did he allow me to do this if he didn't want me to have this? And give all kinds of excuses. Or we may say, well, my neighbor has it, he does it, and he's doing well, so why can't I? We really are at very good at justifying our sin, and we do it 10,000 times, and we try to justify them in 10,000 ways. In the end, it all comes down to the same thing. When we sin, and we try to justify that sin, we are guilty of doing Satan's will over the Lord's will, and that is never anything but S-I-N. Sin. And then comes God's Word. I want you folks to turn over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you will, and 1 Thessalonians is just before 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess the, his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles, which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any way, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. And we also have forewarned you and testified, for God hath not called us to, unto uncleanness, but he has called us unto what, Christ? Holiness, godliness. And notice in the verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Now look back, if you will, and at Philippians chapter 4, if you will, and just a few books back to Galatians, Ephesians, and, and Philippians chapter 4. And you look at, if you will, at verse 8. Here we have another verse that really challenges us along us. He tells us, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are of good, pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. And folks, as we believe the word of God, the shield of faith flies up, and the arrows fall to ashes. You see, Satan's desire is to defeat us, and that's very clear in God's Word, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. His primary means of accomplishing that is getting us to sin. And when we sin, we do so because we have come to the conclusion that sin can provide something for us that God cannot provide. And sin is always rooted in the doubt of the goodness of God's character. And when you and I sin, we doubt God. And when we doubt God, we disbelieve God. That's why John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, that very thing. So Satan causes us to doubt God by leading us to sin against God and by causing us to justify our sin against God. And when we fall into this trap, we are guilty of degrading God's character and elevating the devil's character. And no good can come from that. Amen? So keep that shield high. Walk by faith. Love God. You know it was in the Garden of Eden when Satan first launched his first fiery dart when he tempted to eat to doubt God. He tempted her to distrust his word. And since then he has lit every arrow he fires at the people of God 
from the same fire and with the same fire, and he tempts us in the same manner in which he tempted Eve, and he reasoned he does it, is because it works. And you don't change something when it works. And so it works on us, just like it worked on Eve. He tempts us all according to the same pattern, and of course that pattern is, uh, is very clearly by, outlined there in Genesis chapter 3. Interesting enough, though, the Lord, when he was tempted by the devil, over in Matthew chapter 4, what did he do? He was, he was attacked with the same type of fiery dart, same thing that he, Satan used on, on, uh, on Eve, and the same thing he uses on you and me. And Jesus defected the way Eve should have. You see, he reflected the devil's dart the way we should. And how should we do it? With the Word of God. That's why it's so important. And I, I don't know how, how, how well you memorize. I'm not, I'm not good at memorizing. The only way I can memorize is the way everybody memorized. And that's repeated over and over and over and over and over again. And asking God to help you to be able to memorize God's Word. Because you see, when Jesus was tempted there, he didn't have a copy of the Bible where he could look up a verse of Scripture and read it back to the devil. He had to memorize it. He had to know it by heart. And he quoted the Scripture every time Satan came his way. He quoted the Scripture back to it. Every time. The Word of God, the truth of God, is what we must have if we would see the fiery darts of Satan quenched. So... What is the shield of faith? It's simply trusting in God, taking Him at His word, and believing Him in all things, and it is putting Him and His will above everything else in life. So that when Satan launches his darts at us, we are able to hold up the shield of faith, and watch them, those arrows fall harmlessly to the ground. And we walk away in victory. Amen? So the shield of faith is more than just a piece of armor to be taken out for our protection when needed. The shield of faith is what makes the Christian possible. Amen? That's why he said in Romans chapter 1 verse 17, that this kind of faith is the lifeblood of, it ought to be the lifeblood of every believer. And some people have more faith than others. And every time you, every time you exercise your faith, it makes you stronger in your faith. And so every time you're tempted, it, every time you're tempted, it makes you stronger. And you exercise faith till you just walk and believe God by faith. One of the greatest Christians that I've ever read of that walk by faith was a man by the name of George Mueller. I read his life story. Anybody here ever read the life of George Mueller? A boy, what a man of God. He believed God and trusted God. It, it was amazing. It was amazing. I think that uh, uh, Brother Lester Roloff was a man in our own life that we could see as an example of a man who lived by faith. And I believe that some, uh, as I believe that when he took that plane and flew out to go to Missouri that, night, that day back in, in 1983, when he got into the air, he was going, going and he believed that God would take care of him and he tested God that at the time and the, and, and, uh, the plane didn't make it. He went on to heaven. And uh, yet, I believe he said, he thought in his mind, he believed God. You know why? Because all of his whole life he had lived trusting God and believing God. He would feed six or seven hundred uh, young people down there every day, three days a week, three days, uh, uh, three times a day, seven days a week, and clothe them and take care of them down there. And I went and observed it and saw it and saw what God was doing. It was amazing what God was doing down there in that place because one man decided to step out and live by faith. So the shield of faith, which actually is just 
childlike faith. And trust in the Lord is a shield that the arrows of Satan cannot penetrate. And that shield will protect you here. And just like the Roman soldier who would die in battle, you know what they did? They carried them off of the field in their shields. So the shield of faith will carry you home and bring you into the presence of the Lord Jesus. And that's exactly what happened to Brother Rola. May God help you and me to really experience what it is to trust the Lord by faith and believe Him. And believe that He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. How? According to the power that worketh in us. May God help us to do it. Amen? All right, we'll close there. And I want us, if you will, those that are watching, thank you for watching tonight. And I trust that this time with the Word of God and talking about the shield of faith was a blessing to all of you. Thank you very much.